you want to have a welcoming figure that draws your eye when you enter the court, that serves to anchor the pantheon of representations that you have assembled. And there's a sort of centrifugal force that works. You look around, but you come back to the Hope Dionysus because he's not only welcoming, but it's also enigmatic. This youthful god, a reflection of a lost Greek original. The Greek object would have been a religious cult figure in a temple. By the Roman period, the holiness of the object is lost. It's simply a decorative piece emulating the great Greek past. And it could have stood in a Roman bath, it could have stood in a garden, it could have stood in a villa. Dionysus is shown wearing a short chitin and an animal skin over it with long flowing curls. He's shown ever so more youthful, almost androgynous. Often shown holding a, a tall staff, a thyrsus, and a drinking vessel on the other hand. And leaning on a personification of hope which gives added meaning to its history. In the 18th century, it was broken and it was restored because it was simply unthinkable that you would display a sculpture in its fragmentary state. It became one of the crowning glories of the collection of Thomas Hope. At the depth of financial distress in the First World War, it was sent at auction and bought by the great-grandson of Benjamin Franklin. The statue traveled to Palm Beach, and it was uh, simply a garden sculpture in a, in a fine estate. It was thought to be a lady. From then on, it really sank into oblivion. Till it reappeared at Sotheby's, where I found it, and it's gained its prominence, being again the centerpiece for the Roman court. One wonders what will an audience in a hundred years think of it, whether it will go out of fashion again, whether it will be um, reinterpreted, whether we will know more through new excavations. One always wonders how it will be regarded in a hundred years or a thousand years. <laughs>